Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I know we are getting some people that are joining right now. So um, I'm gonna do a very quick intro and hand it over to our speakers for today's session. Um, welcome, welcome today. So glad to see some familiar faces and um, some new ones. We're so glad you're here. My name is Sarah McAllister. I am the Senior Associate Director for Alumni Career and Professional Development here at Tulane University in the Office of Alumni Relations. Uh, we also have Nicole Bush, who is our Senior Director, and she will be all things tech support today. So if you have any issues, feel free to just direct message her. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later this afternoon. Nicole will also put that link in the chat um, throughout the session today. So I believe that is all the tech, like the housekeeping stuff. So I am so excited to have uh, Camila and Sydney here today um, from Kubrick. We've, I've had a couple conversations. Nicole has had conversations with Camila and um, I just think the work that they are doing is fascinating and can be so helpful and a great resource to our alums. And so I'm actually going to hand it over to you both to introduce yourselves and then um, lead us in our discussion today. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having us both. Hi, um, like I said, we're from Kubrick um, and uh, we're, you know, here to share a little bit about our consultancy. We work in data and tech, um, but more importantly, how we're bringing people into the data and tech industry from non-technical backgrounds or pretty much every major. So if you're an alum who's recently graduated or have been out in the world of work for a while and are kind of considering how can I get into tech, even if I didn't study computer science or a similar degree, um, there's a lot of roles and we're here to kind of share some of our insights and how we can get people, uh, people into the industry. So I'm Camila, I'm the University Relations Manager here at Kubrick. Um, I've been at Kubrick for two and a half years now. I've worked in our London HQ, um, as well as here in our kind of New York, um, US headquarters, but we are expanding across the US and we'll, we'll explore some of those kind of uh, pockets of opportunity as well. Um, I'm really excited to have kind of worked on all sides of Kubrick's strategy and growth, um, working with our clients to understand what their tech challenges are, and now working with the universities to kind of meet people who um, have the potential to come into technology and have some of these transferable skills that the tech industry really needs. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined by Sydney, um, who's a Tulane alum. Hi, everyone. I'm Sydney. I just graduated from Tulane in May with a BS in neuroscience and a BA in environmental studies. And I've been working for Kubrick for about six months as a data product consultant. Um, and I'm excited to talk later in the presentation about uh, some transferable skills that you can bring into this industry as someone who did not take a traditional degree path like I did not. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about that a little bit later. Amazing. We thought we'd first kind of set the scene. What is the opportunity? Why do we need this? You know, we refer to it as diversity of thought um, and that comes from having all kinds of experiences including your educational background as well as your socioeconomic background um, and, and all kinds of aspects that make up diversity. Um, and there's a real big need uh, to bring that into the tech industry. It's by reputation very homogenous and I wouldn't think it's an unfair reputation when you think of who's in technology you might have a kind of quite clear idea of people under Steve Jobs who that might be um, but that's really holding the industry back so I you know the importance of why data and technology is, is such a fast-growing industry one of the fastest in the U.S. the U.K. and around the world is it's what's driving business today so we're seeing a 50 percent increase year on year in data engineering jobs and that's kind of one of our specialisms it's become the fastest growing role in the U.S., um, more sought after than the kind of typical data science roles that people might think of because there's so much data to process. Like we, you know, are, are sat there, we're creating so much data every day. And there's a misconception that, you know, data was once called the new oil in terms of its value. Uh, but unlike oil, we're not running out. We're, we're just making more. Um, and that's a lot of information to process, requires a lot of specialist skills that not a lot of people have. Um, and the value of it for businesses across industries is, is enormous. We're seeing businesses increase their annual revenue by $65 million a year by just increasing a data consumption by 10%. And that's something that data engineering, data management, and some of our other specialisms can help businesses unlock. Um, and they just don't have the skill. And this is something that we refer to as the digital skills emergency here at Kubrick. And, and what that really means is 
there are far more jobs than there are people with the skills to understand how data, AI, and cloud technologies in particular are shaping businesses. So less than 4% of students a year graduate with a computer science major or a data science major, um, but there's been a 334% increase in data jobs since 2013. Um, and like I mentioned, data engineering is a particularly large area that's growing. Um, and this kind of accelerated skills divide was already well underway from the early 2000s, but COVID-19 pandemic, you know, Gartner estimated it accelerated digital transformation by seven years. So in just two years, um, we've grown leaps and bounds in terms of our capability, but don't still don't have the people that we need um, to harness that. And most importantly as well, as we increase our data consumption and use important automation tools like machine learning, we're under threat from biases if we don't have diversity of thought in the way that we use this data, understand this data, um, and use these tools. At the end of the day, companies are missing out if they're not having representation of who their customers are in the room determining how these algorithms work. So it's more important than ever that we're bringing diversity in. And just to give a snapshot of what diversity in, in tech uh, in the US looks like right now, women are still a hugely underrepresented group in technology, it's plateaued. In the last decade, I feel like we've had really amazing conversations about the importance of representation of females and non-binary people in technology, but it stayed level at about 20% representation. Um, that's not moving. And part of that, and we'll get into that in a moment, is, is who we're inviting into the industry and those skills that we're determining as useful. Um, but there's also obvious significant underrepresentation of various at racial and ethnic minorities, um, particularly once you get up to leadership as well. So we need to think about how we can invite more people in the industry um, and harness kind of that diversity of thought. I mean, one thing that explains that is this kind of confidence gap that STEM in particular creates. Um, this applies to both women and other underrepresented minorities. Uh, you know, in junior high school, it's something that Accenture came up with, cracking the gender code. This confidence gap starts at a very young age. Um, we see that most girls have a passion for STEM technology, computing in their younger years, um, and things like cultural barriers within curriculum, within um, teaching staff and leadership, lack of role modeling. Um, we really see a, a loss there um, in engagement in computer science um, and engagement in technology. In college, that picks up again, which is great. Um, it's fantastic that colleges like Tulane are providing an environment where women and underrepresented minorities are exploring different learning pathways in STEM. And I'm excited for Sydney to kind of talk about her experience in STEM at Tulane. Um, but at that point, people might not be on the pathway or have a full major or correct qualifications to enter data and technology. But what they have gained is really good exposure to STEM thinking and STEM mindsets. Um, and we're going to explore some of those um, tools and, and ways of thinking that picking up STEM at a college level or at least minoring or um, exploring different learning pathways uh, can help bring women back into tech after losing this sort of confidence gap. Uh, but really importantly, Technology is an amazing um, industry and opportunity to kind of overcome the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing, um, especially when we have a gender pay gap, when we have um, pay gaps with underrepresented minorities, getting into tech and bringing those transferable skills is an amazing way to overcome those gaps in society. As one of the fastest growing industries, the abundance of jobs is clear. We just need people with more of the right skills um, and a recognition in this industry that other skills are valuable. Um, but also we're seeing a breadth of opportunities open up across the country to help people um, either access jobs if they're not living in traditional what was traditional tech centers or move to places that are more viable, especially for more recent graduates um, or people looking to make a career transition to reach a higher quality of life. So, you know, in the early 2000s, 90% of what was called innovation sector jobs across technology and R&D were in those kind of key hubs that uh, were traditional San Francisco jumping out as one and San Diego and Seattle. But um, this last year, we've seen the greatest influx into places like Texas and Florida and the biggest outflows of those traditional hubs. And what that means is that those skills, companies are trying to decentralize, open up more opportunity across the country and lower that cost of living. You can see kind of from some glass door research that we did, a data engineer, the salary difference between San Francisco and Houston, for instance, which is where we're seeing a lot of rules pop up, is only 10%. But the cost of living in San Francisco is 103% higher than in Houston. 
So the opportunity to train in these skills and get jobs in these lower cost centers is a massive opportunity to kind of fight those gender pay gaps and get people in career acceleration for um, socioeconomic mobility, um, which is definitely a challenge that industries are facing across the US. So I'm going to pass it over to Sydney to kind of explore some of those transferable skills, give a bit more of a background on her experience coming to STEM and, and what she's learned. Yeah, so before we kind of jump into the slides, I'll give a little bit more background about kind of where I came from, what I studied in college. So I came into college thinking I'm going to medical school. That's what I'm going to do. That's the path I'm going to take because I love science. I've always loved science. Um, that's why I studied neuroscience. I worked in a lab for three years. I wrote a thesis. I did all of that stuff. And I still love science, but it got to the point where I got really burnt out, as I'm sure a lot of people get. Um, and I decided that I needed to kind of make an industry change, some sort of switch. Not that I would never go back to school. I just wanted to learn something new and really challenge myself um, and kind of use the skills that I had in maybe a little bit of a less traditional path. Um, so that's when I came across Kubrick. And I was always one of those people who was like, coding is so difficult. I'll never be able to do that. Uh, and six months later, I do that almost every single day. And it's really cool. And I think, like we were saying, a lot of people are kind of scared of the unknown, especially with tech. It's seems to kind of be some barriers to entry. But when you're in a very supportive environment like Kubrick is, um, it really does foster learning and it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to get things wrong. Um, and I think if you come at it with that approach, anyone can do these types of jobs and they're really important in a business. So I'll kind of talk about that a little bit more um, in the next slides. So communication is obviously one of the most important parts of working in a business, um, but I think this is especially applicable to tech roles because a lot of business users who are not as close to the tech don't really understand what data is, how it functions in a business, anything like that. And if you can be that person that acts as that middleman to kind of communicate the technical aspect to the non-technical people and then also communicate requirements back to technical people, that's a very, very useful skill. Um, and I think that you know a lot of majors and degrees have a lot of applicable skills in this realm. Um, if you are open to learning and like learning, this is a great job for you. You can learn about tech and be that person who acts as the middleman between maybe higher level stakeholders in a company and the developers who are working on a product or working on a feature for an app or a website or a database or something like that um, and help that flow of information go a lot smoother. Um, and then this is kind of in that same vein, but more industry specific. Data is its own industry, but it also exists in every single industry on the planet because data is just information. So data could be like uh, an Excel spreadsheet. It could be a video file, an audio file, a text file. Data is really any information that a business uses. Um, so if you have that domain specific knowledge and you combine that with some technical knowledge that will take you really far, um, there's a role in a lot of you know, data jobs called a subject matter expert. And it is when you understand that industry and the subject of the data really well, um, and it will allow you to really translate and communicate the data better. And this is especially important in data visualization because you want to make sure that you're telling the proper story with the data, because anyone can look at the numbers and say, okay, I'll make a bar graph, I'll make a chart, I'll do this, I'll do that. But if you can actually tell a story with that data and prove a point, um, that will kind of provide a lot more business value. Um, and it's important to also bring creativity into this. Creativity of thought, I think is really important. And when you come from a more diverse, less technical background, you'll be able to bring something new to the table. And I think a lot of people in the industry do really appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. And, and just to jump in from our client's perspective, um, often uh, people with more traditional tech backgrounds want to use the next fanciest tool, the most expensive tool, the most complicated tool, even if that's not something their business users are comfortable or happy to use, even if there's not budget for it. So understanding, I think, coming into tech from a non-technical background, 
you can see what the product's going to look like as someone who used to not understand it and now someone who does. And you can really relate to people, the business users. Um, what's the most simple thing to learn? At the end of the day, most data projects fail because of cost and you know, um, business users, it's hard to change people's ways. And if you don't provide them a solution that's better than the current one they have and easier to use, people will get stuck in their own ways and carry on with their Excel spreadsheets because that's what they've always known. You need to make a product that's going to implement and be used across the business, not just kind of confuse people and, and they put it to one side. So it's really important that you can come with that perspective of, I didn't understand how to use this before and now I do. I think I've definitely seen a lot of people unable to kind of learn new tech. So having that translation is really, really valuable. Um, cool. Can you explain yeah. that, Sydney? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that, especially when you're talking about more senior stakeholders um, who've been in a business for a long time and maybe they don't want to learn something entirely new. You need to create features, create products that are like have the user's best interest in mind. So coming from a non-technical background definitely helps kind of put yourself in their shoes. Um, that's kind of a big part of, you know, creating a product and like the before steps is creating something called user stories, which is where you think about how a user would actually use what you're creating to help you kind of better, better create it and have it actually be usable in the end. Um, so that kind of fits in with the Agile framework. Agile is a framework for product delivery and it kind of prides itself on being very adaptive and flexible and scalable um, because the way the Agile team functions is very cross-functional. So it's not like each person does one specific thing. Everyone kind of does everything and you work together, um, you know, maybe playing different roles on different days to deliver a lot of early value for products, um, which requires a lot of teamwork and a lot of problem solving and, you know, sharing knowledge and also reflecting on the work that you've done. That's a big part of the Agile framework is doing something called a retrospective, which is where you get together with your team after, you know, a week or a couple of weeks or whatever increment you're working in and talk about what worked, what didn't, what you want to do moving forward. Um, and this is something that we're taught at Kubrick from the very beginning of training. Um, we always work in teams. You're never really doing anything alone. And we're always trying to improve on what we've done. Um, and so we do retrospectives every couple of weeks, every week, like I said, whatever the increment is that you and your team choose. And it's a really valuable tool to keep that communication strong and um, keep teamwork really strong as well. Um, and then again, talking about curiosity and creativity, coming from a STEM background, this is kind of like a bit of me. So I, by nature, I'm a very curious person. I ask a lot of questions. Um, I am curious to understand things. And I think when you have done a STEM degree and you're interested in science and math and technology and all that kind of stuff, and I mean, this is applicable to humanities as well, um, but I think it kind of stands out about STEM people is that we're very curious and we want to know how things work and break them down and build them back up and understand them um, and data and tech kind of functions in that same way because like science and medicine it's always changing there's always new things coming out you have to really stay up to date in order to move forward and progress and having that analytical mindset of wanting to know why things work will take you really far because you will want to learn and want to, you know, stay reading current events and teaching yourself new technologies. And I think that's a big hallmark of Kubrick in general is we're always kind of looking for what's next and, you know, helping each other out and pushing each other forward. And if someone doesn't understand something, you know, you can turn to the person next to you and ask them to explain it to you and they will. And it's very um, collaborative in that way. So having that curiosity, I think also will take you very far. So how are we bringing this sort of diversity of thought into the tech industry at Kubrick? And thanks, Sydney, I think you really helped bring to life there. Any misconceptions about tech being sitting in a dark room by yourself coding, it's ultra collaborative. 
um, especially the field that you work in data product. And um, if anyone does have any questions along the way, feel free to put those in the chat um, or we can open up the floor. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, but um, I think you've already kind of broken down some misconceptions just in your nice description of the skills that are needed. Um, so the way that Kubrick are kind of approaching this problem and how we're bringing diversity of thought and those transferable skills into the industry, what are we doing? So um, Kubrick exists to kind of overcome this digital skills emergency um, by training people from all backgrounds. Uh, to date, we've trained over 1,500 of our consultants um, across our different specialisms. Um, so that's across our London HQ and now in, in our US arm. And we're supporting organizations um, across industries, over 100 client ports in our portfolio at the moment. Um, and we're really proud to have reached that kind of 50% mark in our US consultant talent pool of 50% female um, and non-binary representation. Uh, so we have a kind of unique methodology to bring people into the tech industry. Um, you know, we, we accept applications from people of all majors and all backgrounds. Um, about 30% of our uh, consultants are from arts majors, which is really exciting. Um, and we provide four months of paid training. Uh, so you're a full-time employee of Kubrick the, the whole time. That training is very much your job. It's in 8.30 to 5.30. Um, and it's uh, we'll get into that kind of methodology of how the training works to, to mirror the workplace. But from the start, it's kind of position that way as, as part of the role, um, especially because our consultants will also add business value to Kubrick while they're training. So they're already in that kind of mindset of how can I deliver to a business? At first it's Kubrick and then it, it moves to client. Um, and we match our consultants with our client projects kind of based on any domain experience like we touched on. If you've come from perhaps a neuroscience background like Sydney, you might get placed with one of our pharmaceutical companies if that's of interest to you. If you have relevant lab experience or internships or previous work experience, we have people pivoting into Kubrick from traditional engineering backgrounds um, with you know years of work experience in the aerospace industry, for instance might come to Kubrick, retrain as a data engineer and get matched with one of our travel clients if they still want to stay in the aerospace industry, but from a different perspective. That domain knowledge and is, is really, really valuable, whether from an academic or a work experience standpoint. Um, and the whole time that our consultants are on site, uh, we have a dedicated people team who not only kind of do the ad hoc touch points, if there's issues with the client, um, stalls with the project, uh, areas of frustration, but um, more importantly, in terms of a professional um, and personal development plan, because we understand that, like we also mentioned, tech is ever changing. How are we making sure our consultants are staying up with their upskilling, getting access to certifications with our tech partners like Microsoft or Amazon, um, keeping ahead of the pace of change so that after their initial consultant period with Kubrick, um, they're ready to go on and, and carry on in the industry and are our best place to do so. Um, and at the end of those uh, two years, that's our kind of initial consulting period um, where you've kind of gained experience either in a long-term project with a variety of industries. Um, our consultants are welcome to go on and join their client full-time. About 75% of them are doing that at the moment. Um, they've gotten to know the business uh, and they want to keep advancing there. Or they might go out and explore new industries or startups or rejoin Kubrick as a senior consultant and kind of gain some of that project management and leadership skills as a squad leader. So there's a lot of kind of variety whether you want to specialize more technically or um, work on that leadership and project management side of things, which also requires a lot of those transferable skills we've been talking about. In terms of um, how we train, so how are we bringing people in? Our, we have a kind of really set training methodology we've been evolving over the last five or six years. And it's kind of boiled down to this, this concept of discover, learn, apply that we've been working through. So that's combining elements of instructor-led training, self-learning and team-driven tasks which really play on a lot of the strengths of people coming out of a variety of majors um, or different work experience backgrounds. That way they can kind of develop their key skills really quickly. Um, the four months is intensive, but um, uh, kind of designed to be so and support you through that. Um, our kind of tasks and self-learning help you assess your progress and make sure you're learning and understanding everything. Um, it's very much not passive sitting at a computer um, watching a video and then filling out a quiz, but it's very interactive training. Um, and Sydney can answer any questions as well that you might have about her experience in training. Um, and building, importantly, building that foundation of capability. So we understand that we're not going to teach you every tool or tech under the sun. We're going to teach you how to program in SQL and Python as our two key languages, a variety of data visualization tools, cloud-based platforms, but it's really setting 
our consultants up to go on and and employ that um employ that uh, attitude of continuous learning which we also um, touched on as a key transferable skill when you have that foundation of capability but also a passion and desire to keep learning that's how our consultants kind of best set themselves up for a career with longevity in, in tech um and importantly the kind of team driven tasks are set in the business context so all our consultants are working in agile throughout their training uh it's not just about learning skills but applying them in project-based work to hit client site kind of ready to go and that includes a full two-week sprint project at the end with presentation skills which are also really hard to come by in technology but really really important <laughs> um and just to touch on a few of what those projects actually look like when we bring people from non-technical backgrounds into tech um we're working across industries um everything from scaling the provision of electric vehicle charging points strategically across the us with one of our energy clients um, we've worked on oncology r d drug trialing optimization for pharmaceuticals um, which is really exciting to see the difference that can make they reduce the time to trial from 15 days to one day using python automation um, so the impact you can have in industries uh, even if you're not a doctor yourself um, but kind of want to have that impact is really powerful with data um, we've looked at reducing carbon footprints in real estate and we also provide kind of volunteering opportunity as well for our consultants because it's really important to uh, give back using these data skills that we're um, giving people so we've worked with charities like mental health innovation we just finished up a two-week sprint with them to anonymize really sensitive patient data and then create more optimized processing around how they do text responses to people kind of experiencing a mental health crisis so um, there's a lot of really incredible impactful ways that people who are looking to kind of transition into tech can then give back with those new skills and just wanted to give a really brief overview of how you can join us if there's any interest to pivot into tech. Um, we take applications on a year-round basis. Um, and again, graduates and alumni of all experiences um, can apply with us. Our virtual assessments after application are very much designed to test for that potential. So we have a logic test, um, very similar to some of those IQ tests you might have done online, putting shapes in the right order and stuff. And that's really just to kind of understand how you think. Uh, commercial awareness is really important to us. So how data was applied in industry, any examples of that and presentation skills. So those are really what we're looking for when we kind of test for potential. And we think that's a really great way of kind of engaging in the data industry and understanding those transferable skills. Um, so we are recruiting for January, but we have uh, roles on an ongoing basis. And at the end, I'll provide Sydney's contact details. She can also be a great point of reference if you wanna ask about the process, her experience, and use her as a reference on any applications. Um, shall we open the floor to questions? Let's do it. Yeah, it looks like you've got some great ones in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what recommendations do you have for resume writing? How can we best share our potential for the world of tech in the application process? That's a really great question. I mean, Sydney, kind of did, how did you kind of approach your application from your background? Any tips or tools? I can come at it from a recruitment perspective as well, but. Yeah, so when I applied, I had someone reach out to me on Handshake, um, and then obviously I did my due diligence and researched the company um, and tweaked my resume cover letter, all of that good stuff. Um, but this is something that I did with all of the jobs I applied to, is I didn't have necessarily like a one format resume. I made sure to change my wording and, you know, kind of frame my experiences in a way that made sense for that industry. Um, so kind of like, Put myself in maybe their shoes and see what kind of things would they be looking for so i think with data and with tech you want to think about how did you provide value in your role so you know you can say oh you know i managed this and i did this project and did that but how did it actually create impact um what was the end results how many people did you communicate with um did you increase business revenue by this percent? So I think framing it in that way will really help. Yeah, definitely. I think we take people with absolutely no coding experience. Some people might've done R or MATLAB in some of their undergrad research. Um, and those are definitely applicable, but even if you didn't touch those things, I definitely didn't in my undergrad, any experience with handling data, data analysis, whether that was in research, 
for your degree, for internships is really valuable. And just having that perspective on how you conducted that research and what you extracted. And like Sydney said, that kind of value piece is, is really, really powerful. And then other than that, just showing a general passion for data and technology or whatever industry you're trying to get into in your resume and understanding of how it's being used. Um, you know, frequently we, we talk to our candidates about any kind of um, ongoing tech trends, but also any innovative ways um, organizations have been kind of working with data lately. There's a lot of exciting news stories out there. So a bit of research around what's going on always goes a really long way. Um, awesome. Um, uh, we have got asked how diversified is Kubrick in America at this time? Uh, geographically, so we have our base in uh, New York and we are um, currently recruiting for consultants to work in Texas across Houston and Dallas and those hubs that we talked about. And we'll be expanding into Florida and other regions um, across 2023. It's a really exciting time. We were the fastest growing consultancy in Europe uh, when we were kind of founded in London and we've got really big ambitions for the US. So I'm sure you'll see Kubrick kind of across regions, um, but for now our focus is kind of Texas, New York and expanding into Florida uh, for the meantime. Uh, in terms of Kubrick's diversity of a workforce, um, we're yeah proud to kind of have 50% uh, female non-binary representation, 40% ethnic racial minority representation. We're always looking to increase this um, and have more conversations about the other ways we can understand diversity we're considering, you know, partnerships to help promote um, the importance of neurodiversity um, and neurodivergence. That's really important to us um, and other kind of ways that we can expand. So if anyone ever wants to reach out and um, have any of those conversations, um, we'll give our details at the end. And in terms of, I guess, diversity of what the areas that we're working in. So we train in um, different practices. Sydney's a data product. And I think we've got another question down the way, Sydney, about that. So I'll come on to that um, and what that means. We kind of have more back end, traditional, heavy data engineering um, roles for those who are a bit more technical or more interested in the coding. So data engineering, business insights engineering. Um, but then we also have data management, which similar to data product is more on a business focused agenda. So not necessarily how to deliver and implement a product or project like data product. Um, but the strategic use of data across the business, who's accessing it? Is it safe? Is it compliant? Is it reliable? Is it accurate? Um, all those things. Uh, how does data flow in a business? So it's really a more strategic understanding of data. Um, and so all of those different practices also appeal to different skill sets. And again, we can share more information about those different practices and kind of how that works. Um, so I'm going to jump to that question. So does Kubrick teach people to be product owners versus coders. Um, Sydney, what kind of, what is the balance in data product between coding and product ownership? Yeah, I think uh, data product is the most product owner-esque of um, the streams at Kubrick. Um, and so how we start off the training is doing all of the kind of strategic context, business process modeling, risk management, um, you know, agile framework, all that stuff. And we do that for three or four weeks and we do projects where we apply that knowledge as time progresses and as we learn new things. Um, so you definitely get that background. But we also do three weeks of SQL, three weeks of Python, a couple of weeks of data visualization. So you come out of it being very well-rounded. Obviously there's things that some people are better at than others. Some people are better at the stakeholder stuff and some people are really amazing at Python. Some people are great at both. Um, and so I don't think it's one versus the other. You kind of get to do it all. And then wherever your strengths show, that's probably where you will continue um, forward, if that makes sense. Yeah, awesome. We definitely have people, our data products when hit site and become product owners throughout their two years. And by the end, they're kind of fully fledged product owners. Um, so it's a great way to kind of accelerate into that career path for sure. Um, we had a question, we've got an interesting conversation going on about um, UX research and tech layoffs. And there's definitely um, a lot of conversation right now about, about tech, but um, it really depends on kind of what industry you're going into. I think in terms of making yourself stand out um, on a CV, which was the question kind of amongst these layoffs from kind of infamous technology companies like Twitter, um, you know, it seems like the market's tight, but um, it's it's shifting. So if you can kind of um, in your CV play up your understanding, really make sure that you 
show that you understand the value of UX and technology in other industries, um, particularly as we kind of come into some economic challenges, businesses are going to be looking to use data tech and apps to streamline their customer relations um, and kind of cut down um, costs when it comes to those time saves. So if you can kind of relate data and technology and UX design to how companies can really save and optimize during kind of upcoming challenges, then I think that should really stand out. That's a lot of the conversations that we're having with our clients is, you know, there's going to be a lot of investment in data and technology, even with kind of um, recessionary challenges coming up because that's the way that companies innovate and, and stay ahead. And um, it's a it's a great opportunity, I think, for businesses to uh, keep investing in, in the right spaces. Um, we've also had a question about um, how about helping people with cybersecurity training, currently um, undertaking a postgraduate course in cybersecurity. That's a really good question. Cyber is for sure on Kubrick's um, agenda. It's on the horizon for us. In the UK, we've introduced a cloud engineering program last year, um, and that will link a lot into the cyberspace. As we're still growing in the US, uh, we don't yet have that capability over here, um, but it's definitely something that we're looking to implement. So I'd recommend just sort of following us on LinkedIn and following our website. So when we do develop those practices over in the US, um, you can be kind of first to know about, about what's going on over there. Um, Okay, got um, what age diversity and our consultants remote or travel to a customer site? Uh, I mean, in terms of age diversity, we're predominantly working in the graduate to one to two years experience space. Um, it's an opportunity for uh, people to really accelerate their true careers from a more junior standpoint. Um, so we, we have people coming into Kubrick with more experience than that, but that market for now um especially be, with the kind of paid training aspect um people have come from education more recently it's an easier transition and i think sydney you can kind of speak to coming from college and, and going straight into kubrick's training um in the uk again we have more capability where we have more senior people coming in um with more experience but that's not a market we're currently focusing on in the us i mean yeah sydney was your kind of experience coming in uh, from straight from graduating? Yeah, so I graduated in May and I started right in the beginning of July. So I didn't really have too much downtime, but I think the transition was really great because training kind of gives you that stepping stone in between school and learning and like functioning in a business environment. Um, and like I said earlier in college, I worked in a lab. So that's a very different environment than working in a more kind of corporate setting. So for me, it was really great because I wasn't just thrown into the deep end um, and I got to come out of training feeling like I had a much more well-rounded understanding of the industry than when I came in and so that I could be confident kind of going into projects either within the company or with the client um, and not feel like, wow, I'm a fish out of water, like total imposter syndrome. So I think it really does help um, if you're kind of fresh out of college, maybe one to two years. Um, and it also provides you with a bit of a community as well because we come in in cohorts of around 30 people um, and you become really close both, you know, personally and professionally. I've met some really, really great friends and amazing people. Um, and so I think it's really helpful as a stepping stone if you're more of a recent graduate. For sure. And I think it also helps, we have consultants coming from across the country to our New York office. So yeah, Sydney, down from Florida. <laughs> We've got people from Oklahoma, Indiana, across the spread. And so coming into cohorts as well really helps with that relocation. Everyone's in very much in the same boat. We all came over from London, so we really relate. <laughs> um, and in terms of that remote travel to customer site, um, we've been closely monitoring across the pandemic and now coming out of it, um, our clients' working practices and mirroring those. And the hybrid model has definitely solidified. Our consultants are working maybe one to two days a week um, in their client offices. Um, it's very much determined by the client. Some might still be fully remote. Um, rarely do they ask for more than that. Um, so um, we do also place people geographically on, on relocation because a lot of the times our clients kind of have solidified the hybrid model and, and do want to have our consultants kind of embed into their teams and really understand their challenges um, from the ground up which means a couple of days a week, uh, potentially in, in a client. 
Um, and we've got a great question about um, increasing diversity. So, you know, we are, that's something we're trying to do. Are there any internal measures to retain and support employees such as DEI groups, holistic company policies, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we're really proud of. And we understand that um, the gaps in diversity and representation are not just in recruitment, but in that retention piece. Um, so how are we supporting people, um, especially when our um, consultants have, you know, frequently a very positive experience in Kubrick, but then go off to client site? How are we keeping those touch points and keeping people engaged and supported, um, especially in different industries and different environments? So we have our diversity champions working group, um, which is uh, across the UK and the US offices, it's a nice collaborative piece and our diversity champions. There's a committee which help inform that policy that Kubrick's implementing, um, run initiatives, provide personal advice and support. Um, and then the network is open for anyone to join and get involved in those initiatives, whether that's running awareness pieces, um, podcasts, um, fundraising. Um, it's pretty much across the board and we very much welcome everyone to create content and pieces to post out internally and externally to keep that awareness going and help people feel connected to their groups. Um, we also have mental health first aiders um, so that any consultants having challenges with relocation, training, joining client site, have a first port of call. Um, we understand mental well-being is also really important in the DI agenda and with um, talent retention. Um, and our university outreach team as well, which Sydney and I are part of. Um, is all about bringing, um, connecting up students with their alma mater um, to either provide some insight into any DEI initiatives going on in campus um, to help support um, minority groups who are looking at coming into Kubrick um, and combine, providing that touch point as well. Uh, any final questions coming through? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're asking about learning a software engineering, Python, Java, C++. I mean, Sydney, do you want to go into a little bit more in terms of um, what kind of tools and tech your training in particular covered and what you're kind of hoping to learn after that foundation? Yeah, so in training, we learned SQL and Python. I had never sat down to code a day in my life until the first day of SQL. Um, and while at first it was a little bit confusing and jarring and Kind of like what is going on with practice like anything else in life you will pick it up anyone can learn to code it's just about kind of training your brain to think the way the software does um and you can ask anyone in my cohort i was like oh i really don't like coding i'm not good at it and now i use it every day and i love it so it really is i think more feasible to learn than a lot of people think it is um and in training when you're doing it all day every day um, you get the practice that you need to kind of get to that proficiency level to be able to teach yourself further. Um, because once you have like that basic syntax and understanding down, it's a lot easier to, you know, find resources to teach yourself further. Um, I would love to learn some other languages in the future. Um, I don't know if that's in the cards for right now, but I think Java is also a very, um, consistent language across a lot of businesses. So eventually I would love to learn that. Um, but right now I'm using a lot of Python in the project that I'm doing currently. Amazing. Fantastic. I think that might be it for questions. If anyone has any last minute ones to throw in, um, go for it. Um, but um, quickly just to share our details, if you do have any follow-up questions, uh, you can reach us by email, um, either quickly take a screenshot of this or um, write it down um, or be in the kind of recording of the YouTube. Uh, please reach out to either myself or Sydney uh, with any questions. Uh, Kubrick has a very active LinkedIn presence where we share a lot of um, thought leadership, podcasts, ways to kind of engage in the industry if you're just interested in, in the kinds of conversations we're having around um, DEI and, and bringing people into the industry. Um, and I'll speak for Sydney. If you are interested in learning more about her experience in training um, and are interested in applying it all, um, she'd be more than happy to be your reference. <laughs> thank you both so much for your time today. And thank you everyone for the great questions and, and conversation in the chat. Um, I will follow up with everyone with the recording as well as um, Camilla and Sydney's contact information as well. So if you 
as soon as right those questions often come up as soon as we end the session so if you are one of those people who has a question in the next 10 minutes feel free to um, reach out to them with the follow-up email um, so thank you both so much and thanks sarah oh, it was such a pleasure and yeah great conversation and great questions absolutely all right enjoy your day everyone thanks bye thank you bye-bye